Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, Parlor, and Instagram. And of course, be sure to visit www.mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Cops nabbed former a Disney former child, child star Joey Kramer. Former child star Joey Kramer, Kramer best known for Thursday. his role in Disney's Thursday, Flight of the Navigators, has been arrested in Canada in connection with a bank robbery. The 42-year-old faces several charges, including robbery, failing to stop for a peace officer, and dangerous operation of a motor vehicle. Constable Harrison Moore of the Royal Canadian Mounted... Under these bridges, I felt like bad for people who loved the movie. But no one felt like I would like that I let a lot of people down. Growing up, and that I um, thrown out in you, and that that's not me alone and abused. Just fighting to survive. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 327. Out now on digital is Life After the Navigator, a documentary that explores the making of 1986 cult hit Flight of the Navigator and the roller coaster life of its young star, Joey Kramer, who struggles with drugs, lead him away from a career in the movies and a life of crime and addiction. A moving exploration into the life of a once promising star now trying to rebuild himself and reclaim his legacy. Life After the Navigator reminds that behind every film is a human story that is as rich and complex as any screenplay. And joining me now for the second time on the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is the director of Life After the Navigator, Lisa Downs. Lisa, I thank you very much for joining me today. Well, you're very welcome. And also the fact that you're on episode 327, I think it was, is pretty impressive. Well, the last time we spoke was for Life After Flash, and that was 2.20. And ah. I, I actually took a sizable break of around four or five months and got back into it. So, I mean, like, the, I think last month in February alone, I think I've done nine, eight uh, episodes. Wow. Um, a lot of films, a lot of content going out there, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, there's a, the joys of lockdown is everyone's just consuming everything. Exactly right. Um, I want to. There's a lot to cover here with your movie. I want to let's talk. Let's talk about the film Flight of the Navig- Navigator itself. Now, I remember specifically watching that movie as a kid. I was like eight years old. My older brother rented it from the local video store. For people out there who remember what that is, um, oh, I'm them. Yep, I'm, I'm definitely one of them too. Um, and just the idea of a of a kid flying a spaceship, like you've seen, like I've seen action stars fly spaceships in in, in space commanders, but a, a child, a 12 year old doing it, it instantly became an instant favorite in my household. Um, do you remember your first experience watching uh, the movie? I, I don't, to be honest. And this has always been kind of a, f- a fascination with me going back from when we did flash just to touch on it briefly, because I would be interviewing all these people who had these amazing experiences seeing these films for the first time in the cinemas and with their parents. And, and I never had that. I don't remember the first time I saw any of the films that I grew up with. Really. I remember the ad for Goonies. Mm. That's about it. When I made my mum tape it off the TV, but they were really just films that I watched being born in 82. I didn't really have the, the theatrical experience when they came out. I was always the VHS generation of these films. Yeah. So for me, it was just part of my childhood. So I don't have that specific memory of it, but I do remember just loving it. Like every time it would be on TV, getting the VHS for it, um, you know, recording it off TV so I could just watch it endlessly. It was a really captivating, magical film that I just am so appreciative that it was part of my childhood. It was definitely one of those films I, I think hits the, like I was born in 81, so VHS generation as well. And I think it's big with our, our generation because the movie itself wasn't a huge hit at the cinema. So that was a film that really made its bones in the States and cable and everywhere else on, on tape. And I think it's something that people kind of forget about that film. Yeah, I think so. And it's it's quite, um, uh, I think, a misconception when you have this classic movie that you just assume it did really well. But it's so common for these types of films to be 
hits when it becomes on VHS and on the terrestrial broadcasts and, and more accessible to people where you can watch them over and over and then learn every line and go on these adventures. So um, it, it always surprises me learning about these films as an adult and kind of doing a deep dive on them when you realise that they actually weren't commercial mm. successes. And that's probably why films like this didn't originally have sequels because studios would be like, well, you know, it is what it is. It wasn't financial. and yeah. But I think that's part of what makes them so special as well. How soon in the making of Life After Flash did you know that Flight of the Navigator will be the next movie that you're going to look at? Uh, pretty pretty soon. I mean, probably about halfway. I knew, I knew probably within the first couple of shoots that I wanted to do another one. And I had actually thought of doing never ending story mm. which will be the third one but at the time i thought you know that would be a really great film because i had made a list of films that i loved and and i just was kind of going through them to to approach people um but at the time trying to get hold of noah was quite tricky so i was like okay well while we're going to look into that let me do another one what would come to mind and then flight of the navigator came to mind um, and that was probably about halfway through filming Flash that I started to really deep dive Flight of the Navigator and Joey's Wikipedia and what happened to him. And I hadn't, I must have missed the headlines when they first came out in 2016 because I was kind of learning about his journey when I started reading about it before yeah. I contacted him, um, which it helps having to, being in the UK, we really have to be thinking ahead because it's a lot of money to keep going back to America to do these shoots. So it was very important to me to start filming for as many of these as I could possibly film for with the restrictions we have with budget and just the two of us anyway. Mm. Um, but because I managed to get hold of Joey, we were lucky that we were able to do some filming for it whilst finishing Flash and then um, also a few other life afters that we've started filming for that I'm not kind of announcing yet, but cool. it was definitely, yeah, to, long story short, definitely early on that we were lucky to utilise the times that we were going to go to the States. And so the last time we spoke, we we touched on briefly um, Life After Navigator because you began filming stuff with it. And you talked to me a bit about how one of the first steps you did like, was in reaching out to Joey. He was actually like in the tail end of his jail sentence and you wrote to him and you guys kind of became pen pals, didn't you? Is that kind of like how the whole kind of thing kind of came about? And during that kind of correspondence with him was at, at the time when you're like, hey, will you be interested in doing this and talking about your life story? Yeah, it, it was it was actually a really fun way to start a friendship with someone. Um when I had been reading on his Wikipedia, there's only so much you can know from the internet and there's only so yeah. much you want, you you think you can believe from the internet because so many times it ends up to be false. Yes. So I, I had known from his Wikipedia page that the sentence that I thought he got and I knew from the Wikipedia what jail I thought he, well, well courtroom he had been in mm. and where the crime was committed. Um, but I didn't know what, if it was federal or correctional center. And, and so with a bit more research, I kind of just contacted the, the BC correctional center and just sent a message and hoped that he got it. And at that time I had um, found out that he would have likely got two years less a day sentence. So assuming that he was still serving it, I knew that he had a couple of months still to go, maybe, maybe five months or something. Yeah. Um, so luckily he, he got my message and his mum called um, and gave me the address where I could write to him. So I remember typing up my letter on my computer to get it perfect wording that I wanted to kind of explain about Flash, which hadn't been finished yet, so I couldn't show him anything other than a trailer. Yeah. And just what I wanted to do with the film. And then I, when I finished it on my Word document, I hand wrote the letter out because I am a very big fan of kind of handwritten letters. I think it's more personal and it's like the VHS store, a lost part of our life mm -hmm. so I wrote this letter to him and then he wrote back straight away and I knew with the post being more reliable then than it is now that it would be exactly a week to the day that I would get the letter back um that he would get the letter and then a week for me to get a reply so I knew two weeks to the day that I sent one that I would get one back so it was quite this like exciting time that we would be writing to each other and talking about his life, but also the documentary and what we could do with it and using his music in it. And it was mm. a really nice kind of creative outlet for him to 
to focus on something for when he got out and it was and it allowed us to develop this friendship and trust that when I did finally meet him in person which was about five months after he got out um it was literally like just seeing an old friend that I had met for, you know it was it was a really special experience Joey is very open very transparent about who he is what he has done um some of the things he talks about can be very heartbreaking very confrontational um you've forged his friendship with him through the letters and in you know, you're talking about it's like meeting an old friend. Having said that, though, more of those interview sessions like with Joe, once he starts going down that road and starts talking about all the incidences that lead him to where he is now? Well, pretty heartbreaking. I didn't know really anything about his life other than what I had read. So I didn't know what had happened really between the last couple of films he had done to getting arrested I didn't know how many times he had been in jail I really didn't know anything um but how I approached the interviews with Sam was I thought okay we've got to develop the trust I don't want to just be asking personal questions straight out the gate if that was me I wouldn't be as open so with Sam I started with really top level questions about the film and the audition and then worked my way across the couple of years that we got to know him to the more personal questions so I that was going to be my approach with Joe But I think because we had developed that relationship through the letters and because he really hadn't shared his story with anyone, it really just came out. There's two interviews um, that we did for the, across those first three days that we met him. And one is where you see he's kind of like in a wardrobe area. That was, we didn't have anywhere to film the interview when he's talking about the film. So we, there was just this little community theater opposite where he was living with a wardrobe room. So we went in there, they kindly let us film there. And then there's that interview with the NASA shirt that we just filmed in the Airbnb that we were staying in. Mm. Um, and that was probably like the second day that we had met him. And I didn't expect it to be so open and emotional, but that was a four hour interview and that really blew my mind (laughs) I mean just I mean I had so many questions like he would say one thing and I was like that could be just a whole documentary in itself so it was really just this eye-opening experience and you when you meet him and I hope this comes across in the film like you feel like you can be friends with him like you've known him for years yeah and you really connect and you kind of talk to him and look at him and go, I can't imagine you ever doing this or being in this position. So when he's talking about all these things that he's done and so much I didn't include in the film just because it's so detailed and complicated, um, it's it's quite astounding when you're trying to like picture him doing all these crimes and being in these horrific personal situations. Um but it really just set the tone for the film. It was great because we kind of got that film, that got that interview in the can, so I knew what I was working with. Then because we were filming over the next two or three years with him, and you can see his transition in his face and he looks yeah. healthier and he's more vibrant and he's happier, I think it actually really worked that that interview happened very early on because it wouldn't have had the same raw emotion and I think if we had been interviewing him about all the hard times when he was in a good position where he's like, you know, I don't really think about the hard times, it wouldn't have had as much impact. So it really worked out well how, um, how that all happened. And so then after that interview, we could really just focus, focus on kind of what he was trying to achieve going forward. I mean, what's really remarkable about it as well is that immediately the film becomes more than a documentary about this cult classic movie. It becomes a film about, you know, this guy who is struggling and trying to rebuild his life. And I, I absolutely love the film because of that. Um, as you yourself, as a documentary filmmaker, I imagine, you know, working on this movie especially, it really goes to show that that type of filmmaking, you just have to really allow the story to take you wherever it wants to take you, don't you? Exactly. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of a documentary is you're just documenting what happens. But also it's not my story to tell, um, which is why I really like the idea of doing these films that are more than making of. So the audience gets like an insight into this real person behind these characters. And that's what I was hoping to be the point of difference between these films and other like making ofs that are around and about at the moment. Um, But 
I wanted it to be, I to give him a platform where he could tell his story his way and I would just kind of be a fly on the wall as he tells it because what I said to him at the beginning and same with Sam, like I, we didn't want these to be creating drama where there isn't and that's hard when you're starting out on a documentary and you don't know what the story is and I had a lot of friends of mine saying, well, if you don't know what happened to them, like how do you know it's going to be interesting, maybe you're mm-hmm. wasting your time and um, you just have to kind of trust that, that um they'll be open and honest enough and not to say that their stories have to be so dramatic like Joey's was, but just to have that open and honest connection with someone that they can just share about their life without feeling like we're going to judge them or pressure them into saying something they don't want to say or making something into more of like a TMZ expose drama than what it is. So it was very important to me to just allow them to kind of tell it how they want to tell it. You know, when I was watching the film, just a few notes I took down regards um, to the similarities. And this might be a long bow, so bear with me here. But in the Fly to Navigator movie and what's happening with um, Joey in real life, there seems to be a similarity in the issue of missing time. So in the Fly to Navigator, the character of David, he goes missing for eight years. And the film is about how he loses the years of his, of his life and he has to regroup and, you know, know who he is and what his place is within the world. And it feels like Joey's kind of going through the same thing. He's missed all this time. Um, and I know he looks back on it not so much in regret because, you know, there could be a million situations that could have happened to him if in Hollywood if he did become a big star. And that's something he really outlines in the film. But it does seem to me that... This is a film about trying to claw back some of that missing time, not only as a performer, not only as a person, but as a father as well. And I think that's something that's really stuck with me. Um, is that something that you really felt as well um, making the movie? Yeah, 100%. Um, that was kind of the the premise for the tagline as well, that it's all about the journey home. You know, you're watching David go on this journey where he's separated from his family and he feels lost and almost abandoned and that's exactly what Joey's situation was. You know, you'll know from the documentary the kind of upbringing he had and then he just became this kind of lost soul trying to work out where he was and and how to get those connections again, Um, you know, and his connections were lost from family and friends through his drug use and the crimes he was committing and obviously David, to no fault of his own, (laughs) got a got taken away with Max but it was very similar um and that was that was definitely something that we were thinking about as we were doing the documentary for sure the film ends with a reunion of the flight other navigator cast and crew so you had the director Randall Kleiser who we interview in the movie and numerous other people from the cast as well Veronica Cartwright and Cliff De Young and in a bunch of other people too and you know in most in, in in that situation, a lot of these people haven't seen each other, I think, like, what, over 30 years, so especially Joey, of course, because of the situation mm-hmm. that he was in. What was that experience like seeing all these people who once shared this, uh, this moments and these memories together that was such a pivotal part in the, the lives, not only their lives, but the lives of movies of fans around the world, um, to see them come back together again um, and, and share the same room and after such a long time? very surreal (laughs) I have to say you know it's I mean there were there were a few moving parts on that day um Randall had very kindly arranged it I mean it really wouldn't happen without him he was doing work with that studio so they allowed us to film in there he Mm. Randall still connects with cast and crew a lot so Randall had emailed everyone who was there to say hey um let's do this reunion let's all go and hang out and joey will be there and the only exception i think was albie whitaker who was younger jeff who funnily enough both randall and i had tracked down through linkedin and facebook to invite him um but it really was all down to randall and so i had i was like a headless chicken that day trying to run around and do everything anyway so it was like trying to have my production hat on but then kind of step back occasionally and look around and go i'm standing here with the freemans like it's too, it's too weird. Um, but it was such an amazing day to see how they all interacted with each other because 
what I really loved about it was that I was interviewing the cast and crew about their time on the film and they all had such fond memories of the film, which is why they came to this reunion and to see Joey again. But they also had this very real concern and love for Joey and what happened to him. So it was really nice to, when I interviewed them, um, it showed how close knit they were as a family, even if they hadn't seen each other for however many years. Some people had, but a lot of people, especially like you say with Joey, hadn't seen him since the film. Um, but it was just this really special day where they were reconnecting and reminiscing about this film that they were, you know, that all these people and all these fans still love that, um, yeah, it was really special and, and especially for Joey because he had had some concerns about, and I think he touches on this, but he he had concerns about how people viewed him, mm. um, family and friends and cast and crew from the film. So he had always wanted to reach out to people, but he was ashamed of what had happened. So I think for him to have that um, reassurance and validated that these people really cared for him and they don't mind what his history is uh was just incredible for him and incredible to watch as well and for me as a fan to be interviewing all these people and seeing all these people um yeah it was a it was one of the best days of the production for sure so for everyone listening Life After Navigator, available now through digital. I watched it myself through Amazon Prime. I believe most territories have it on Amazon. Um, and look, it's, Lisa, it's just a really remarkable documentary. And, you know, over the last year, I've come, I've been sent a lot of movies about the making of, you know, documentaries of certain films and such. And uh, this one, hands down, I think is one of the best I've seen. Um, and I really oh, do I think, think um, the work that you did here is fantastic. And, the, and Joey's story is just remarkable and um you know, you can't help but pull for him, and, and we still, I, I think everyone does. Um, so, congratulations to you, and um, I can't wait to see uh, what you're going to do with the next um, uh, in the Life After series. And um, until then, uh, thank you very much for your time today, and congrats again for the film. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.